everyone and welcome back to this introduction to cultural anthropology. In this unit of the course, we will talk about something that's the basis of all social relationships, the exchange of things. So think about the last time you gave an object to someone. Perhaps you handed out cash at, say, a convenience store and walked out with a snack. Or maybe you sent a birthday card to a friend far away. Maybe you went to someone's house for dinner and brought a cake and some flowers. Either way, we give and receive things all the time. And anthropologists think that the exchange of things materializes the social relationships that exist between people. And this is a big takeaway from this lecture. You may walk away now, but I hope you will stay for a little longer. So let's unpack the examples of exchange relationships I gave you a minute ago. So in the first example I made, you gave a pre-established amount of money to a store clerk in the convenience store and received a snack in exchange. The snack is yours to keep and the cash is the store to keep. This is called a commodity exchange. A commodity is an object. It's produced by people, it's produced through human labor. And this commodity has value, meaning it satisfies human needs of some form and it's exchanged for something else. So what is the value of the commodity? The commodity can have value because of how it's used. For example, your snack has value because you eat it, it's delicious, it will give you energy, and it will keep you alive. A commodity also has value because you can exchange it with other commodities, and you can think of it as exchange value. So for example, you can trade your snack. Let's say your snack is a granola bar, and you find a friend and you trade your granola bar for a piece of fruit. So this means that you and your friend have decided or have agreed on the fact that the granola bar and the piece of fruit are equivalent or that they are equal to a third entity. And this third entity is what we would call the price of a commodity. So the monetary expression of the exchange value is its price. But when you trade two commodities, Directly and without this monetary transaction, it's called barter. So giving uh, the granola bar for a piece of fruit, it's a barter relationship or a barter exchange. Now, let's imagine you bought this granola bar at the convenience store and you meet a friend and you like the friend and you offer them your bar to keep. No need to, to give you cash or a piece of fruit in exchange even if they offer. This transaction is a gift. So. Let's pause for a second. Why would you give your snack bar to your friend? Take a minute and write down a number of possible reasons. And the second part of this question is, once you give the granola bar to your friend and your friend walks away with it, do you have any expectations or obligation that your friend will reciprocate the gift in some way? Think about it and write down your thoughts. So when we talk about reciprocity in anthropology, this means the obligation to give, to receive, and to reciprocate. And these things are important all together. And we will return to this in a little bit. But let me go back to this hypothetical snack. It started off as a commodity, something you purchased through a monetary exchange at the store, and then you gave it out as a gift to someone else. And anthropologists have approached the distinction between gifts and commodities in different ways. So for some, these are very different things. Gifts are personalized exchanges and commodities are depersonalized exchanges. And early anthropologists uh, believed that you could in fact classify different societies depending on whether the main form of exchange relationships were gifts or commodity exchanges. And this is an outmoded way of, to think about this. But anthropologists today hold that we can think of gifts and commodities as distinct things. However, one can become the other. So sometimes the exchange of gifts is functional to exchanging commodities. Think about a business relationship between business partners, maybe taking each other out to dinner to, to create, a, to cement a business agreement. And the other way around, as we have seen with the snack bar example, a commodity can become a gift. And so other anthropologists hold that the distinction itself is not that useful because the status of things changes all the time depending on the context and depending on the social and cultural relationships within which these exchanges take place. 
But either way, everyone agrees that when people exchange things, they really are also materializing their social relationships. So in 1925, the French sociologist Marcel Moss, you have already encountered him in this course, wrote an essay on the gift that became really influential in anthropology and beyond. And Moss was interested in what he considered to be archaic or primitive societies, and this is no longer a concept anthropologists use or that anyone should use. But either way, Moss drew from a wealth of ethnographic materials and reports collected by other people to find answers to this what he saw as a universal puzzle. So when someone gives a gift, eventually the other person will reciprocate with another gift. So why is this the case? Moss asked, or in his words, what is the principle whereby the gift has to be repaid? What force is there in the thing given which compels the recipient to make a return? So before we hear more about Moss and what he found out, Let's pause for a second and why don't you try and find an answer to this question. What do you think? So in this armchair study on exchange practices worldwide, Moss came across a principle that was important to Maori societies, the indigenous people of New Zealand. And this principle was called the how. The how is a mystic power as described by Maori people to ethnographers at the time. This power lives in the forests, but also lives in certain categories of special valuable things or objects called taonga. And these taonga are objects that Maori people give to each other. And the how always wants to return to its place of origin. However, the how can only travel through the valuable object, so the taonga, which a person will give in exchange for the original gift. So what happens when people don't reciprocate? Well, terrible things happen. And why? Because uh, Maori people explained to the ethnographers at the time, the gift, in fact, contains part of a person's own essence. And most thought that these examples from Maori ethnography could give really important insights into a universal principle of gift giving. So when you give a gift, you are giving away a part of yourself, symbolically, and when you accept a gift, you are receiving part of a person's essence. And this is a very dangerous thing to keep and to hold on to. It needs to be returned, it needs to be exchanged back. In doing so, the exchange of gifts create enduring bonds of dependency and relationships between people, or relatedness, to use a different word that we have encountered in this course. And this is one of the ways through which people relate to other people through things. In the conclusion of his essay on the gift, Moss noted that the universal importance to accept invitations, to reciprocate, and to accept gifts, and to offer other gifts in exchange could be found worldwide. A gift uh, always has to be returned, and not to do so is morally demeaning in all societies. And often people might return more than what they have received. And there are, of course, context-specific cultural norms regulating how the exchange is supposed to take place. But Moss was interested in these big universal statements and questions, and this will become outdated in anthropology, but uh, anthropologists today still pay a lot of attention to how people relate to each other through the exchange of things. Another way in which people relate to each other through the exchange of things, or another example, it's one of the most famous um, exchange systems in the history of anthropology, the Kula Ring. Remember the ethnographer Bronislaw Malinowski, he conducted research in the Torbjörn Islands in the 1920s, and he was interested in two things. So first, he wanted to lay down the foundations for a model of anthropological research based on the methods of participant observation. And we talked about this, and we talked about this in the first units of the course. But Malinowski was also curious about why Trobian Islanders, and particularly men, sailed from island to island to participate in something that they called Kula. Kula is a social institution. It's a form of exchange that takes place within uh, the broader community of men in the Trobian Islands. And in the Kula exchange, two things are exchanged that are of su huge symbolic importance necklaces made of red shells called sulava and bracelets or armbands 
made of white shells called muali. So the Torbjörn Islands are connected by trading routes in a circle of sorts, so one can navigate between the islands on these routes clockwise or anti-clockwise. And this spatial indication really only makes sense to people with a mechanical clock reference, which of course the Torbjörn Islanders at the time of Malinowski's uh, ethnography, it wouldn't be a, a, a fundamental kind of cultural reference for them. But interestingly, Malinowski noticed that the Kula necklaces were exchanged only clockwise between the islands and the bracelets would only travel counterclockwise. Suppose a man in Torben Island receives a visit from a trade partner and the trade partner has set off on a journey from a different island and during the journey uh, various things will happen, there will be an exchange of other things, there will be barter, there will be transaction, but the, the thing that the man will most look forward to the journey or most will talk about is that he will expect or hope to receive a kula shell, either a necklace or an armband, depending on where he traveled from, and would expect to receive a gift in return. So if you think of this Torben Island as a circle, if you're facing the center of the circle, you're always re receiving the armbands from the left and necklaces from the right and passing them on. So in this Kula institution was really the focus of a lot of passion, a lot of mystique, a lot of romanticism and a lot of rituals for Torbjörn men. And this exchange relationship of men in the Kula exchange was really a lifelong commitment. The two partners would continue to exchange necklaces and bracelets in a sort of a permanent relationship. However, the exchange was never simultaneous. So one would give or receive a necklace or an armband, and then later on he might receive a necklace or an armband. So as men uh, sail to other islands, they typically meet their Kula partners, and the partners are responsible for hosting them, providing them food and gifts, etc. And men competed to be the ones receiving certain valuable Kula arm shells and necklaces. And they did so by enticing the Kula partners and offering gifts like pigs, like taro, like bananas, axe blades, spoons made of whale bones and other really valuable objects and delicious foods. And if the men participating in the Kula exchange giving and receiving necklaces and bracelets would boast about the Kula they had received and they would boast about their plans to pass them on to others, it was really a big source of pride. And when men receive a necklace or an armband, they can't uh, keep them for too long eventually they need to be passed on to other men. So each necklace and armband has a specific name, a history, uh, a story of the people who've possessed them beforehand, and a certain reputation, and also a value. Not, they're not all equally valued. And these necklaces and armbands, interesting, they were not everyday ornaments. Men sometimes wore them to accompany uh, elaborate ritual, festive dresses, and even then, only for very special ceremonial dances, for feasts and very important gatherings. However, most of the armbands and necklaces that people exchange in the Kula were in fact way too small or way too big or very fragile or too valuable to be worn at all. And so Marinovsky asked, if these things don't really have a purpose, people don't really wear them, what is the purpose of all of this? To find the answer, we need to understand that, first of all, only a few men participated in the Kula exchange. This was not for everyone. And they would only exchange with certain partners. And in particular, men of a higher social rank had a much larger number of trade partners in the Torbjörn Islands. And to be a man of high rank meant to have an obligation to distribute one's wealth to others and to pass on valuable Kula necklaces and armbands. So the Kula is really the symbolic performance of a relationship between men. It's this long-term ritualized practice. It's worthy of endless conversation and it's a source of lots of claims about rank, about power, about value, and about history. So here's a question for you. Can you think of an object you have given to someone or received from someone that symbolizes, performs, and maintains the relationship between the two of you? And has there been a return gift from this other person to you, or from you to this other person? 
So Malinowski claimed that he, as the ethnographer, could see the Kula as a whole, but that the people participating in it might not necessarily see it in its entirety as a coherent system. And this was a fairly patronizing approach, but it does call attention to a dynamic. This is something that we understand from the perspective of the subject uh, themselves or stemming from an outsider's, you know, researcher's own perspective and interpretation. So finally, I'd like to return to the idea of reciprocity that I have introduced earlier on in this lecture. Reciprocity, remember, is the expectation to give and to receive. An anthropologist called Marshall Salins proposed a classification of different kinds of reciprocities. So three types, he said, generalized, balanced, and negative reciprocity. And generalized reciprocity means uh, giving without an immediate expectation of return. And balanced reciprocity means giving and receiving with an expectation of fairly immediate, fairly equal return. And negative reciprocity is when one takes without expecting to give back. And Salins found that the three types of reciprocity typically correlated with the social distance between the people involved. So let's pause for a second and can you think about one concrete example from each of the three types, something you have encountered, either in your own experience or just in your own uh, readings. So the main point here is very simple, is that giving and receiving are always the enactment of a specific social relation. And social hierarchies and power relations are usually also expressed through forms of unbalanced giving. This is all for today. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you all very soon.